Hello everyone, this is Ted Bauman here, editor of the Bauman Letter. I'm here with uh, Clint Lee, my partner in crime. Uh, this is your Money Matters video for this Monday. Uh, we've been talking a lot lately about the type of stock market uh, activity we expect to see over the next while. Um, we've become somewhat famous uh, on YouTube for predicting a W-shaped bottom and recovery. Um, but it's starting to look like things might be a little different. And uh, I certainly have no problem uh, changing predictions based on uh, new information that comes in. Um, that's what any rational person should do. Uh, and it's beginning to look like we could possibly see a U-shaped process rather than a double bottom. Now, that doesn't mean we won't see a lot of uh, spikes and dips as we go along, but uh, what's looking like uh, a, a current um, sort of over, overblown, irrational, if you like, market um, may actually turn out to be just a long, slow decline that finally bottoms out sometime in the future. Now, um, that uh, is certainly a possibility too. So today we thought we would talk about um, the factors behind what's going on. And we're going to start with the fact that the stock market is, by historical standards and by anybody's reasonable uh, statement or, or, or um, you know, thinking it's overvalued, right? Clint, why is it overvalued? Tell us uh, the facts. Yeah, well, I think uh, one of the first things to look at is the indexes that are, that are always in the headline um, that are close to their prior highs. Actually, when you look at the NASDAQ, the NASDAQ's uh, I think up now year to date, but you know, a lot of what's going on is that these indexes, the, the leadership is relatively narrow. It's a lot of, especially larger cap tech names, especially the names. And when you look at their market caps, they got the word trillion in it. Um, these are the ones driving a lot of the gains here, year to date. And kind of illustrate why this is important. Uh, when you look at a, something like the S and P 500, that is a cap weighted index. That means the larger stocks make up a larger portion of that index. So for something like the S and P, the 10 largest stocks actually make up about 26% of that index. Mm -hmm. The S&P 500 was just an equal weighted index. Um, each stock would only be about 0.2%. So that means the 10 stocks, any 10 stocks would make up about 2% of the index. Uh, so I wanna illustrate this point now with the chart. I wanna show you this chart year to date. Uh, this shows the S&P 500 index, the, the cap weighted one. That's the best performing thing on here. It's down about 11%. When you take that same index, the S&P 500, and you will look at it through that equal weight lens, that index is down about 19%. So the average stock is faring much worse uh, than the larger cap names. And just to, to highlight this point further, um, the, a lot of the leadership we're seeing out of the, the tech space, uh, some of the healthcare names as well, we're still seeing a lot of struggles in, in other industries. Uh, industries like financials and industrials are still down anywhere from 25 to about 30% here year to date. So now, what about uh, what about the different uh, sectors? You've also got a chart that shows uh, earnings. What's happening there? Right. So that, and that's the other thing. So, you know, originally we started talking about valuations. Um, here's the thing, even though the, the S and P is down 11%, you think, well, there's, there's still value to be had there. Valuations must be better since the index is down and, that's not necessarily the case because earnings estimates uh, have been coming down quicker than what the markets have. And so that's what I'll show you here at this next chart. This chart shows earnings estimates for 2020 for all the different S&P 500 sectors. Uh, but we have a, a blue line. That's what the earnings estimates were for growth at the start of this year. The red line is where they are currently. So take the energy sector at the top here, for example. Energy sector was actually expected to have the best earnings growth of any sector coming into this year at about 23% or so. Uh, but because of the pandemic, because of everything going on, earnings for the energy sector are now expected to be negative. So that is driving now the expectation for a decline of over 100%. Uh, for the S&P, originally expected to have 10% earnings growth this year. Now that's a 20% decline that analysts are baking in for this year. And that's what the, now segues into the valuation argument. So despite the fact that the S&P is down 11% so far this year, valuations are actually richer now than they were at the beginning of the year. And I'll show you that in this chart here. This chart shows the S&P, which is the blue line year to date, but this gray dash line is that PE ratio. And as I mentioned, that PE ratio has moved higher uh, from where it was at the start of the year to about 21 and a half times or so. 
uh, despite the fact that the index is down, is because earnings estimates are coming down even quicker. So basically what we're seeing is that as earnings decline and prices go up, the, the gap between the two of them gets bigger and bigger. So let's look at this from a historical perspective. Uh, this is not the first time that that's happened. Um, I've got a chart here I want to show with you. And basically it, um, it covers the stock market really going back to the very beginnings of the U.S. stock market. And you can see that historically there have been times that green line when uh, the, the long-term price earnings ratio, a moving average of, of uh, price earnings uh, has peaked. Uh, and two of the most uh, tallest peaks, 1929 and 2000, those were two of the biggest stock market crashes in U.S. history. Now, what's interesting is that the, uh, the chart also overlays interest rates. And you can see, obviously, that as interest rates decline, it, it tends to push stocks upwards. And we know why that's the case. It's because stocks become more attractive. Um, the net present value of future earnings uh, goes up when interest rates go down. Um, and a lot of people have pinned their hope on this. But the interest rates are so low now that the Fed has been making noises saying, we're not going to let them go negative. I mean, they've said, you know, this is, that was not, that's not normal. It's not appropriate for the U.S. economy. Um, so really the question investors have to ask themselves is if that's what's driving it, how much longer can we go? So let's talk now about what actually is driving this irrational, what I call irrational um, behavior in the markets. And, I, and I've got a couple of things I want to speculate about. Um, one of them is technical, and, and as we know, at the beginning of the year, a lot of people had short uh, positions or leveraged long positions, all kinds of, of derivative bets on the market. And when the market took a big uh, decline, um, they had to unwind those positions, and that led to a lot of buying um, simply to try to basically cover all those positions. And so that pushed things up a bit. Um, but the big driver really is the whole question of where we're going with the virus, right? And here, my gut feeling is that people are overreacting. They're expecting miracles from the scientists uh, out there trying to come up with treatments and vaccines. Um, they, they read any good news out of any big city around the world as meaning that this is all almost over. But what we're seeing is that it's popping up in other places and you know, the long-term trajectory is not going down in the United States. It's actually not even plateauing. Uh, it, it's, it's continuing to go up. Then, of course, there's the stimulus, uh, but we know that that's uh, not working well for everybody. And it's, you know, it's only meant to last a couple of weeks, really. Uh, then we've got the Fed pumping in. Um, but as you mentioned earlier, a lot of it has to do with things like the weighting of the indexes and the kinds of companies that are overrepresented in the indexes. Um, so it all comes back to the question now of fundamentals. And fundamentals are really, you know, the question of, what kind of earnings are we going to see going forward and what kinds of, uh, you know, prices going forward? And that's where the question of the U-shape versus W-shape comes in. My take is that the, uh, the average investor is looking at the situation, uh, is really hoping that, that this is going to go back to where we were before with this exuberant 10-year bull market. And so they're grabbing onto any shred of information that seems like it's going to be a positive thing. Meanwhile, Behind the radar screens, the economic data just keeps getting worse and worse and worse and worse. Now, we have really three months to go before quarter two's data comes out. So my gut feeling is that maybe we will end up seeing a market that jags back and forth, uh, you know, probably at a fairly stable level uh, over those three months. But then as things start to come clear, it'll start to decline. Maybe not a sharp decline, but people are going to get, they're going to say, look, I would rather be in bonds right now. I'd rather be in cash. And that will lead to a long-term slow U-shaped thing. So let's look at some of the facts behind this. I'm going to show you a, a series of charts that back up my argument. This first one um, really shows the, one of the most remarkable things that has ever happened in any of our lifetimes. Uh, this shows the actual level of payrolls in the United States. Uh, you can see uh, growth up until the financial crisis, that it fell dramatically, then pretty steady rise, um, very geometric that, and then, you know, it's like it fell off a cliff. Look at that. We're back to where we were in 2010 in terms of employment. That's a lot of money not being spent. That's a lot of people who are not out doing economic uh, activity that is ultimately drives the economy. 70% of the U.S. economy is based on consumer spending. Next chart shows level of consumer credit, another just dramatic. I mean, this is unprecedented. 
people are not only staying home, they're not spending money, even though they could with their credit cards. Um, you know, people are uh, trying to avoid debt. They're, they're trying to deleverage at the same time that there is a, a, a big slowdown in economic activity. So another big uh, drain on potential earnings. Now let's look at the uh, state and local government situation. Look at all the states that are looking at over 50% or 40% uh, declines in tax revenues. Now, one of the biggest drivers of local economic activity uh, is the expenditures of local authorities and states on things like fixing highways. Remember, they're responsible for unemployment benefits. They're responsible for their share of uh, Medicaid payments and all that sort of stuff. So, you know, these states are going to have to raise taxes in order to make up the difference here. Um, and that means another uh, headwind, right? Now, I just want to share one final chart that shows uh, the situation here in my state of Georgia. Um, now, this is the one that I think is, in a way, the most important. You can see that economic activity actually began to decline before uh, Governor Kemp ordered uh, stay-at-home measures. And uh, we've seen that since there's been a partial reopening in the economy, there hasn't really been all that much reaction. And I can share that in, in the area here where I live, Basically, people are not going back to, to stores, to restaurants. They are hunkering at home. A lot of uh, business owners are reluctant to open. So it comes down to the fact that there are enormous headwinds against um, the actual real living, breathing part of the economy where people actually produce things and uh, produce services. And that ultimately feeds into the earnings of big companies. And that is why we cannot expect these PE ratios to continue like this. Now, question is, Clint, I'm going to put this to you. What should people be doing under these circumstances? Give us some advice. Yeah, so, you know, what's this entire show is about what to do with our stock portfolios, right? So, you know, when you look at your stock portfolio, if you've been, if you've been able to participate in the gains that we've had off the lows, um, simply consider taking some of your profits. And that, I'm not saying sell your entire position, but simply take some of the profits uh, that you've had from this rally, because I've used, as you've pointed out, Ted, uh, <laughs> the future is, is very uncertain. Uh, we don't know what the markets are going to do from here, but um, as, as the numbers indicate, there's still a lot of uncertainty and apprehension um, about seeing the economy rebound very quickly and how that's going to play out via the stock market. So take profits if you have them. Uh, the other thing I would point out too is to go through your portfolio and start to sort out sort of the, the haves versus the have nots within your own stock portfolio. I think you know, that, that's what happened. Uh, that's what's been happening on this recent rally is that when we had the decline, uh, if, whether it was because of leverage and, and derivatives, but the, the panic selling that we had saw you know, virtually all stocks participate in the downside, but then as the dust settled, uh, investors have been going through looking at, well, who's, who's helping enough to, to weather the storm or who is in an in market or an industry that stands to benefit from this. Do the same thing within your portfolio. Go in and look at the, the haves versus the have nots, the companies that are either liquidity stable, you know, or stable enough to, to weather the storm, or uh, perhaps they're in an industry that's going to see a, a benefit uh, from what's going on. Maybe that's something like online retail um, or, or yeah. a cloud infrastructure type provider, because look, entire industries are being upended by this. You know, we've seen but, it in the retail sector. Brick right. and mortar. Uh, so I want to stop, interrupt you there, and just re remind uh, viewers that we recommended it in the Bauman letter uh, over the last couple of weeks. We've we've published some ETFs that we believe have uh, particular growth prospects in this respect. Things like the, you know the online sector, and that's precisely I think what lies behind it is this notion that um, there are some sectors that are uh, not just immune, but actually will benefit. The problem is that that is not the entire stock market. It's not the entire economy. So um, what about companies that have the financial strength and are providing things that everybody else needs? If you had to choose between two, which, uh, how would you make the decision? Would it have anything to do with dividends, Brad? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, so what, one of the things you mentioned earlier was this low rate environment and even speculation that the Fed could take rates negative. I mean, this is an absolutely punishing environment for savers, especially those that are nearing retirement that have saved up a portfolio of assets that need to generate income from those assets. I mean, you've got short term rates at zero right now. You've got 10 year yields hovering right around 0.7%. Um, it's just an absolutely horrible environment to try to generate safe income, especially uh, from your holdings. 
So people are considering the alternatives. And yeah, I mean, it's, it's natural to want to look at, at equity investments to generate income from, but you have to be very discerning in this environment, uh, considering the, the company's in market, but then its financial strength as well. You know, what, what's its liquidity profile? What's its right. cash on hand, ability to, to tap credit facilities, uh, just to make sure that with all the uncertainty, they can weather the storm that's ahead of us. So it's, uh, you know, a little bit of a tooting our own horn here, but the next Bauman letter report uh, that's coming out, actually, we've identified a company that we believe uh, fits the bill that you've just uh, sketched out. And, you know, the interesting thing about these dividend paying companies is that because they do have this higher yield, um, they, they tend to attract investors once people realize that that's where the safe haven is. And so right now they're still relatively cheap. So yields are relatively high, but if you, if you get into them now, you lock in those, low yields on cost going forward. Uh, and you know, by our calculations, um, a company like this one that we've been looking at, um, within three to five years, you could be looking at double digit yields on cost. In other words, w given the growth of the, the company's dividend, given the price at which you can get it right now, in a couple of years time, you could be getting a 10% yield on your investment if you, you know, if you buy at the right times. You'll never get that anywhere else. You won't get it in the stock market. I mean, the long-term average appreciation of the S&P 500 over many, many years, around 9%. If you can get 10% just by letting that yield on cost work its magic, that's what you should be doing. And that's precisely what the, uh, the Bauman letter uh, is going to be offering in, in the next month. So if you're not subscribed, folks, now's a good time to do it. So that's it from us this week. Um, we are not necessarily changing our prediction about a W-shaped or double bottom, um, but it looks like the the current state of play is that investors are prepared to keep pushing prices up even though earnings are declining. Eventually, they're going to realize that that's not happening. They may be a little bit sheepish about it and they'll just stop buying. We'll see lower highs and lower lows over a period of time and it'll be a gradual decline. Sometime in the future when we do have a workable vaccine, things will turn around, but it's going to be probably longer than anybody thinks right now. Uh, and we just believe in being honest. We want to be we want you to be prepared for it. So that's why we're giving you our opinion about it as well as what to do, which informs our Bauman letter. So that's it uh, for us this week. Clint, thanks as always. Um, stay safe over the weekend or rather on the week coming up. Uh, and uh, we'll see you all next week on Monday. Take care.